Long. Um, I'm an assistant professor of horticulture, horticultural crop IPM here at Purdue University. So what I'd like to share with you today is how to scout your hemp plant plantings for pest insects. One of the first things you can think about if you have a planting like this one is consider that pest may be on the edge of your planting, but also in the interior. So I'm going to show you now how you might walk through um, kind of on a diagonal transect to see how insects on, might be on the edges versus the interior. So just starting here from the edge, kind of walk through, take a look at the plants, and we'll demonstrate a little bit more closely um, later in the video, but you kind of want to look at the plant in three different sections. The top part of the plant, the middle, and then the bottom, which is a little more challenging because these are in here pretty dense, but it can be done. And just kind of walk through here and look at each of the plants. And you're looking for um, several different things. The insects themselves, which um, if you know where to look and if they're large like Japanese beetles, they're pretty easy to spot. But sometimes the insects won't be on the plant. So in that case, you want to look for signs things like feeding damage um, or things like uh, waste, insect waste, frass or honeydew, the solid and liquid versions of insect waste. Before walking through, it's a little windy today, but you kind of want to observe the plant from a distance. Kind of take a look, see if you see anybody before you walk through, because then if you disturb the insects, they may all fly away and you won't get a chance to see who's who. So last but not least, I'm gonna walk through here. There are several tools you can use to help you spot insects um, on the plants. So one of my favorites that I like to tell everyone is the very fancy white paper plate, or in this case, styrofoam plate. And these are great because you just kind of stick it under the plant, knock it like this, and some of the smaller insects, there's nothing here right now, but um, that you might not see easily with the naked eye will become very apparent on this uh, paper plate. Also, always have a little container handy. It could be a Ziploc bag or a, maybe a small mason jar that you have at home. You can just kind of come along. If you see an insect, kind of just catch it in there and you want to collect it and submit it to the Purdue Plant Pest Diagnostic Laboratory. Try not to smash the insect. One of the things we like about containers are that the insects aren't gonna get smashed, whereas if you put them in a Ziploc bag, it's easy to smash them. It's contained and submit the sample. And last but not least, um, a hand lens or magnifying glass can really be a great tool, easy to keep in your pocket, um, so that you can kind of zoom in on certain parts of the plant or certain insects um, that you might find. Hi everyone, my name is Zach Serber. I'm a master's student working with Elizabeth Long. Uh, so this season we've mainly found insects that cause either piercing sucking damage or chewing damage. Now, uh, chewing damage tends to resemble this, where you have a leaf that's been entirely just chewed to pieces. But this chewing damage is mostly focused actually around the bottom or middle of the plant. Uh, if you look at the top of the plant, uh, these leaves are relatively untouched. This is why it's really important to scout the whole plant and not just a piece uh, of it. Insects that cause chewing damage that we've found so far are flea beetles, uh, Japanese beetle, caterpillars, things like that. And piercing sucking damage actually usually resembles like chlorosis. So the leaves turn yellow. Now the biggest insects that cause piercing sucking damage on hemp are aphids, white flies, and leaf hoppers. Uh, and those insects are tend, tend to be found on the underside of leaves. But if you don't find them on a leaf that's turned yellow, uh, I would suggest scouting the rest of the plant because leaves that have become yellow are usually abandoned in favor of fresher food. My name is Laura Ingwell and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Entomology at Purdue. Uh, I specialize in insect pest management in horticultural crops and I'm here today to talk to you about pest management in a newly emerging crop in Indiana, hemp. One of the current and a very abundant pests that we know attack hemp is the corn earworm. It's something that we're very familiar with here in Indiana because we grow a lot of corn and we've done a lot of research on how to manage this pest effectively in sweet corn. One of the tools that we use in corn earworm management is a monitoring system. So what I have next to me here is what we call a heart stack trap. 
It's what we use to monitor the flight of the adult moths of this insect pest. We have a pheromone lure that we place inside of the trap. That lure smells like a female moth and attracts male moths into this trap when they're looking for a mate. And they get caught in the cylinder at the top here. And so while we know that this pest is damaging in hemp because we have found the caterpillars feeding on the developing seed heads, so it's particularly problematic in CBD related hemp production, we don't yet have a very good understanding of the economic threshold or the number of moths that we may be catching and when we need to do some sort of intervention in our crop to protect it. So at this point, we have deployed these traps throughout the state in hemp, and we're beginning to understand just the movement within the crop. Um, we can also identify the most vulnerable time of that crop. So it's when they begin to flower and set seed. What you're really needing to protect is that seed production. So by watching our trap counts and identifying when we're finding high numbers of moths and that vulnerable time in our crop when we're beginning to flower, we can then make more informed decisions about the types of management strategies that we can employ to protect that crop. Purdue Entomology and the Purdue Hemp Program have partnered with the Office of the Indiana State Chemist to work to attain some 24C labels for pesticides that are safe to use in hemp, particularly targeting corn earworm, as we have identified this as a problematic pest. The two insecticides that are available are both biological insecticides. One of them is Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt, which is a bacteria that we spray on the plant. The other one is an insecticidal virus, which we can just call NPV. So it's really important to consider how biological pesticides work and what the expectations can be for control when using this um, management strategy. So the most important thing to understand is that the insect is most vulnerable when it is very young and that this product will be placed on the plant tissues and the insects themselves have to consume the product in order to ingest it and then become infected with either the bacteria or the virus um, in order for it to be efficacious to actually kill the, the insect. So in combination with monitoring when we're seeing high numbers of adults, understanding that that correlates to females laying eggs and that that product needs to be on the plant when those eggs hatch, we know that within two days of moth counts, you need to get that product down and protect those plant parts. Another important thing to consider is the way in which you apply these pesticides. So some of them are hard to dissolve, so you need to make sure um, that you're using large enough filters, that you're not straining out the particles themselves that you want to get on the plant. And a lot of them are much more efficacious if you apply them in very high volume, because it's really important to get really good coverage on the plant so that when those eggs hatch, the first few bites that those young caterpillars take are uh, them ingesting the pesticide itself. So the key things to understand is timing is crucial. As young as the caterpillars are, as soon as you can get it on the plant to protect it, that's important. Understanding that that insect does need to consume some plant material to become infected by this, um, the biological insecticides. And then understanding that there's some lag time too for that pesticide, the biological organisms, to replicate within the insect and, and kill them. Um, so those are really key things to consider and having expectations that will meet that in terms of control. Hi, right, Laura. You said you would like to elaborate a little bit. Yeah, no, um, if there are no questions right now, I mean, I guess I am available and would have um, some time to talk about moving beyond hemp, right? So we used hemp as a model crop here. Um, Elizabeth did in terms of scouting and insect identification, and then I did in terms of a particular pest and the tools that we have available. Um, but I think some important things for small farmers to consider is really being um, paying particular attention to the label of the products that they're using, um, because a lot of the organic or biological products that are often used on small farms, you have to have very, very different expectations than you would with some conventional um, products where you can see insect kill within hours of application sometimes. So a lot of the things that small farmers are using need more time 
to kill the insect to reduce its feeding, or some of them will knock the insect off the plant um, quite quickly, but then those insects can recover from that pesticide application and move back on. So I think it's really important to um, read the labels really carefully. They'll help you identify the correct timing and what some of those expectations should be in relation to what the product can really offer. And that can help eliminate, I think, some frustration um, that I hear sometimes from growers who will apply spinosad, for example, over and over, and they're not seeing the type of control that they want of the pest. Sometimes there's just not alignment between what that product can offer and what you hope to achieve in your crop. And like we talked about with the corn earworm in that video, a lot of these um, biological pesticides or organic pesticides work better in a prevention setting or a, a low density infestation. So really having a good monitoring protocol and scouting protocol in place so that you're catching insects when they're first uh, moving into a crop and when damage is starting to begin, you can get a better handle on them than you know, only looking once a week and trying to combat spider mites once you have webbing on the plant um, and they've been pretty well established. Because at that point, using organic tools isn't, can't necessarily um, rescue your crop. It may be too far gone at that point. So Laura, this was uh, my first time growing hemp in a high tunnel, CBD hemp in a high tunnel. And uh, so far the experience has been pretty good. We, we have noticed a little bit of white fly in there, but we just kept on monitoring and I never saw any egg laying taking place or any nymphs, you know, crawling on the underside of the leaf. So we just decided not to do anything because it's not really detrimental just having the flies flying around in that sense. Um, I don't know, what is your opinion about that? Well, Elizabeth and Zach are working on white flies in particular. Um, so she might want to comment more on that. But, um, you know, that's something important in general to note. Just because an insect's there, it's not necessarily causing damage that you need to worry about. And that's something with hemp that we're not sure of at this point, what those levels of toler that we can tolerate with pests. Um, hemp aphids, for instance, we encountered last year um, with some growers and they don't transmit diseases that we're aware of yet in that crop. They tend to feed on the stems. So um, we're assuming that you could to tolerate a fairly high population of that pest depending on when it comes into the crop. But if the plant gets completely overwhelmed, you'll lose photosynthetic capability and it can reduce those buds. So we really need to do more research to understand how many pests um, we can tolerate before we start seeing crop losses. Corn earworm is obvious because it's eating, it's directly consuming the part of the plant that you're harvesting. So that one's easier to say, if you find it, you need to do something because it will eat your buds and then you won't have anything. Yeah, I guess I would just add that, echo what Laura said. I mean, I think in the time that, um, at least we've started collaborating with growers. Maybe one indoor grower has indicated they've had issues with white flies. I don't think we were able to get down there and see maybe because it was during the window when we couldn't travel because of the pandemic. But it would have been awesome to go down there and actually see it. Um, white flies are a pest that I know of, but like I'm not super familiar with. So um, Zach, my student, as Laura mentioned, is really interested in understanding how plant age uh, might be mediating the ability of white flies to damage the crop. So for example, if your hemp is young and they come in and infest those young plants, does it matter more then than it does for older plants? I suspect it does, but um, we're gonna try to get at that with some of his uh, research um, research experiments. And yeah, I mean, we, I need to get out there and, and take some of those um, leaves if you don't mind, Petrus, just because, you know, the nymphs are like so tiny. White flies are so strange, very cool, but strange. and. In the colony we've been maintaining on tomato plants um, at a low level, it's almost as if the nymphs aren't there until you see the adults emerge. I mean, it's as somebody who like loves looking at insects and all of their signs, it's I'm surprised myself how challenging it is to see them. So that's a really interesting point. Maybe they are just flying and hanging out there, but maybe they're you're just not able to see their their eggs and their nymphs until they're at the later stage and then the adults appear and take off. But so many unanswered questions, but lots of things to, to look into 
which is exciting, <laughs> but we're searching for answers. <laughs> At least I haven't seen the cloud of white fly in the tunnel yet. Thank right? goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and white flies are interesting, you know, across all the crops because I feel like in the high tunnels every year, regardless of what I'm growing, I see a few here and there, but I've never had to intervene with any sort of applications or try to manage them. But previous to my arrival at Purdue, there was one grad student who grew broccoli in the high tunnels and cucumber and her crop was completely demolished by them. Mm. So there's also some, I think, environmental factors or some that are playing into when that population really booms. Um, but yeah, in the past five or six years, they're present and they're around, but I've never had to intervene on any of the crops. Um, spider mites is the other one that we talked about a little bit in our videos, but in controlled environments in particular, if you get spider mites, you have to do something. Um, in a controlled system where you're eliminating rainfall, they will thrive and they will take over. And we saw um, at least two growers last year with indoor hemp that had some major issues with trying to control spider mites in that crop. So that's one that you really need to be developing a scouting protocol and getting those early infestation signs down so you can recognize them when they do get into your crop. Yeah, <clears throat> we are cutting a little bit into Dan's time here. There will be additional time for Dan, but um, I think thrip is also a, another interesting one. We see a lot of pressure in the beginning of the season, especially on peppers. And now late in the season, I do notice a whole bunch of it on onion. I mean, onions are being ready to harvest it at this point, but you can just see the leaves are color, uh, covered in thrip damage, not that it really makes uh, any uh, impact on yield at this time, but that I think that that's a very pesty insect. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> that's one that the paper plate technique that Elizabeth showed works really well. Um, thrips and mites, because they're so hard to see on the plant. If you do that dislodging to try to sample them, it works really well. Right. In onions, it's a little different because they get inside, right? So onions themselves, right. onion thrips are a little trickier, but Mm -hmm. In general, that's a good technique. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much to uh, Laura and uh, Elizabeth and Zach. And uh, we can hand it over to, to Dan now. Thank you, Dan. All right. Um, so uh, if you can see everything, uh, I wanted to talk about some new approaches to disease control in, in tomato and in cucurbits today. Um, sorry, I, we can't have a real field day. Um, uh, in the past, in the other two presentations today, you, you kind of virtually got out in the field, but I'm not going to have uh, quite that much. Uh, I'll have a couple of short videos, and if, and if you'd like, you can kind of pretend you're swatting flies and sweating when you see them. But uh, so what I want to talk about today is, is, is some new uh, chemicals. Uh, uh, I'll, I'm glad to answer any kind of questions, but I want to talk about uh, over the last few years, I've, 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 I've uh, have done a few experiments on some alternative and sometimes organic uh, products. So what, what everybody wants to know is, is what do I spray? So, and I, and I will talk about that, I promise, but but um, I always have to mention uh, some, of the, some of the cultural methods that you have to have, otherwise uh, nothing will work. So disease resistance, so for example, for tomatoes, um, looking at uh, uh, verticillium wilt and fusarium wilt, that kind of stuff. Uh, fall tillage and crop rotation, because if you plant the same crop year after year, you'll, you'll get disease problems. Sanitation could be anything from cleaning off your tillage equipment to uh, cleaning uh, and sanitizing transplant trays, uh, avoid irrigating in, in, in the evening, overhead irrigation in the evening, and then scouting and, and disease diagnosis. And the um, photos that I show here, are blossom end rot and botrytis gray mold. Uh, blossom end rot is a nutritional problem. Uh, gray mold is an infectious problem and superficially they may look the same, but it's important to know the difference because uh, they will, they are um, 
they are different and the, and the solutions are different. So here, what I'd like to do is, uh, here's a, a tomato plant. Some of you may uh, get transplants, grow transplants. You're not gonna buy them on this size, especially not in the middle of summer, but you may grow transplants uh, or you may grow your own. And it's important to scout those transplants uh, for disease. And if you look at this one, uh, you can see that, uh, yes, it uh, looks a little rough, but in addition to looking rough, uh, I'm gonna take you on a tour of this plant. You can see not only is it looking a little rough, but it's full of disease. This is bacterial spot. Um, so, and I got this at a box store recently. And um, if you planted that, whether your garden or your field, it, it's possibility it would, it would spread all over. So I wanna talk about some examples of products then. I, I break these down into categories, inorganic products, and that would be today what I wanna talk about is copper and silicon, peroxide-based products, and then biologically, uh, biological product, products with biological active ingredients. That would be botanical products, like for example, um, uh, products derived from a plant, uh, uh, microbial products, either actual microbes or something derived from microbes or a hyperparasite, which is actually a parasite of a parasite. So first we'll talk about inorganic and, and the first one is copper. And this could be copper hydroxide, copper sulfate, copper soap. Examples would be, for example, badge, champ, or coside. And you have to be careful if you wanna be organic because for example, champ and coside I know have formulations that, that uh, are uh, organically listed and, and, and ones that are not. So copper has multi-site uh, contact activity. So uh, it, it affects many different aspects of, of the cell and can kill pathogens in that way, which is good and bad. It means it has a, a wide host range, I mean, a high, wide range of diseases it, it, it can affect, but copper is a heavy metal. And so it's one that we'd rather not apply any more than we have to. So examples of copper use in here, what I'm gonna do is, is talk about uh, diseases I have experience with. Um, uh, so, so for example, copper can be expected to, to have some benefit for early blight of tomato, uh, bacterial spotted tomato, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, powdery mildew of various crops, and then anthracnose of watermelon. And I have here, uh, copper is a better bactericide than a fungicide. So if you call me and say, I'm organic, what can I use for anthracnose of watermelon? I might talk about copper, but if you're a conventional grower, uh, I'm not gonna mention copper because there's, uh, there's conventional products that are better for anthracnose. And the photo is just, if you see the lower leaves dying, this is early blight on, on untreated tomato plants in, in a trial I had a few years ago. So I want to talk about bacterial spot and, and copper. And, and so a couple of years ago, we did a, a survey of, of bacterial spot uh, in Indiana. You see all the little circles there uh, with numbers that represent uh, in, in each county how many isolates were, were, were obtained there, the different, uh, the different um, uh, the different colors represent different species, which isn't real important, but since we have two major species here, that, that will make uh, breeding for host resistance uh, a little difficult. The important part is over 50% of all the strains were resistant to streptomycin. This is not an organic product, but it can be used in, in greenhouses on tomato transplants. Over 80% of all the strains were resistant to copper. And this is important. This is something we'll come back to. So not only is copper heavy metal, but it's not working as well as, as it used to. Now, when I say 80% are resistant, that means that copper may still work, but it may take more copper and, and the copper is not as effective. The survey was, was the result of a specialty crop block, block grant and the Jeff Jones lab in Florida was involved, Tom, Tom Cresswell and the PPDL in Botany and then Liz Mater in Hort. So here, this is another, uh, we're gonna kind of look at uh, this is another, uh, this is my plot this year, my organic plot. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look around the, the plot 
we're kind of look around the, the organic plot here. And then we're going to zero in on the plot right in front of me. And the plot right in front of me has been treated with copper. And it's been treated with copper, which is usually my best treatment. But as you look through the foliage here, you can see plenty of disease. And the reason for that, I suspect, is, is that this year, this year I used a, a, a strain of the, the, this bacterial spot pathogen, which is uh, copper resistant. You see the plate, the bacterial plate on the right here, copper resistant, grows fine on media with copper in it. Whereas in past years, I've used strains that are copper sensitive. So this year, copper is not working. And, I, and this, this slide is also supposed to remind me that the, when I showed you that plant that had caught bacterial spot, I analyzed it in the lab this week and that strain that came out of there is um, uh, copper resistant. So not, if you planted that in your, in your field, not only do you have bacterial spot now, but you have a strain of bacterial spot for which copper does not work. All right, so now we're gonna keep on going on the inorganic products. We're gonna talk about silicon. Silicon is, is perhaps the most uh, uh, abundant element in the, in the crust of the earth. So what can it do as, for a pest control? So the, the product we'll talk about here is cell matrix, which is actually potassium silicate. On uh, mode of action, nobody's, I guess, real sure, but it triggers plant defenses. It, there's a lot of crops like rice blast uh, where it, it's been shown silicon is, is useful. So we wanted to try and look at it on tomatoes. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get cell matrix to work for us. We had four field trials and it really was not better than the control in any of those field trials. And it really wasn't better than the control out of the greenhouse test. We used a soil application. Um, there's other ways to use it. When, when some of these products, they don't work, that doesn't mean that they don't ever work. It just means that we don't, perhaps don't understand how it works, but I've not been able to get cell matrix to, to work. Uh, cell matrix also is labeled for um, insects. In fact, I think it's labeled on hemp. So I don't know if the entomologists uh, uh, have had any experience with that or not. So let's talk about products that have peroxide in it. Peroxide is, for example, hydrogen peroxide, uh, the same stuff you buy in that brown bottle in the, in the, dr in the drugstore. But this is oxidate that has hydrogen peroxide and peroxyacetic acid in it. The mode of action is multiple. When you take peroxide and put it on a cut, you're hoping it kills all the germs that are on your finger in the same way. But when you apply this product on the surface of plant, hopefully it'll, it, would, it uh, would have detrimental effects on any pathogen or, or microbe that it came in contact with. And for that reason, it has a pretty wide range of diseases it's effective against. However, it has little or no residual. As soon as it's dried, it's gone. So uh, it, it has been used successfully in bacterial spot of tomato um, and early blight of tomato, uh, but it's what I call a salad dressing product. For the most part, what you want to use, you want to use oxidate in combination with something else, either alternating it or in a tank mix. And you have to be very careful tank mix. And you have to follow the label carefully. And, and I can help you with that if you have questions. However, uh, we were not, it was not successful when using alternary against alternate leaf bladder cantaloupes in one season or powdery mildew zucchini in another season. And in both those latter two seasons, we used it just once a week and not in combination with anything else. And so it was not successful. Here's, it says hydrogen dioxide here, which is the same as hydrogen peroxide. If you had a, a greenhouse with, with transplants in it, you, if you could use it multiple times a week, that might be successful. Whereas you had a hundred acres, you, you would want to take the time to apply it several times over the course of a week. So for the most part, you're going to want to use oxidate um, in combination with something else. So let's talk about some microbial products for a moment. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is Serenite Opti. This has Bacillus subtilis in it, so that's a bacterium. However, it's not necessary for the bacterium to be alive because it's the proteins in the bacterium which cause membrane disruption and trigger plant, uh, plant defense. And there's a lot of products on the label, so it has a pretty good wide range of, of diseases. 
I've tried it uh, against uh, powdery mildew zucchini, and it was better than the control in one season, better than the, con the inoculated control in, in early black tomato and three greenhouse studies. Um, uh, it's listed in the bacterial spot uh, for tomato in the, in the vegetable guide, not, not my data, but, but other folks uh, in, in the Midwest. And then uh, alternary leaf blight of cantaloupe, it was uh, uh, better than the, than the uh, control in one season. I tried against anthracnose and it was not successful. So um, Serenade Opti may have some uses. You see a powdery mildew of pumpkin in, in the corner there. Another one is a uh, lifeguard. This is another microbe. This is Bacillus mycoides. Again, it's not necessary for the, 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 the microbe to be alive because it triggers plant defenses. And again, it has a wide range of um, diseases it's labeled against. Um, it was successful in one season against bacterial spotted tomato and not in the other, although in the other, it did have, uh, there's something going on, but it wasn't statistically significant. And I'm trying it out again this year. So I haven't, certainly haven't given up on it. So this, this next product is, an, it's a living fungus that you're applying to leaf. It's pre-stop, what you're hoping is it'll compete with the, the parasite on the, on the surface of the leaf and actually parasitize the, the, the pathogen. Um, the why specificity? But where I found that no, the most, uh, the best use I found is uh, an early blight in four different seasons and in the greenhouse test in three seasons. So really pretty impressed with using pre-stop for early blight. However, in one of the seasons we had a little septoria come in and it was not, it was not successful against septoria. I'd still, uh, I need to check that out. I tried it against anthracnose to watermelon and it was not successful. So it's not, it, it's probably not going to solve every problem, but uh, at least for tomatoes, it looks like it has a place. Um, here's another microbial placeholder. This is a Streptomyces, a bacteria. It's Actinovate AG. Uh, its mode of action is, again, uh, competition and antifungal. has a broad host range. I've tried it just against one disease, and that's anthracnose over watermelon, and it was better than the control. Not as good as some of the conventional products, but uh, it, it, it's a uh, bears looking into, I think. Um, so here is, now we're going to look at uh, this parasite here, uh, hyperparasite. It, the, the product is contans, and it's actually a parasite of a, of a, of a pathogen, a parasite of a parasite. So uh, it, it attacks the white mold fungus, which has a broad host range, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, but has a broad host range. So you can apply it to the soil and if successful, it'll, it'll parasitize that white mold fungus in the soil. So uh, it's labeled for white mold of bean, different cucurbits. You see white mold of cucumber in the corner, pepper, and it is in the, in the veg guide. Um, so, uh, what, what, so you can't apply, you're not gonna apply it to the plant, but to the soil, um, but you need to be aware that, it, that the fungus uh, makes a mushroom in the spring and it can blow in from quite a ways away. So you're treating the soil, but, but it, something else could blow in and, and kind of defeat the purpose. Here's another uh, hyperparasite or a parasite of a parasite. This was called agrophage and it's actually uh, 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 a disease of the, the bacteria that cause bacterial spot, bacterial speck, or, or, or bacterial canker. And it's, it's very specific. In, in fact, it won't even attack all bacterial spot strains. So you have to work with the manufacturer to, to get the strain that you need for Indiana, and I, I can help you do that. Um, it, so I've had some success with grower trials with, with tomato. Uh, it turns out it, it, it does not work if used just on its own. But if you alternate it with other copper or other products, then it, then it, it may be successful. But if you um, are interested in it, ask me and, and, and I'll try to help get you set up on that. So the next examples are botanical. This is uh, regalia. This is an extract from the knotweed. And whenever I talk about this, people say, oh my goodness, knotweed is horribly invasive. I hope that they are not growing knotweed just to extract regalia. Uh, from. 
but um, it induces a plant defense, triggers a plant defense like some of the others, has a fairly wide host range. Um, an early blighted tomato, two out of four field seasons it worked. It didn't really work in the greenhouse test. It is labeled for bacterial spotted tomato. Again, that's not my data, but somebody else's. So I've kind of had mixed results with Gallia, uh, but uh, other people have had a better success with it. So I, I, this is, that's my last slide. I just wanted to emphasize that uh, these are just some of the products that I work with, some of the success I've had. If you have questions about any of these or anything else, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about them. But again, just because it didn't work for me doesn't mean necessarily that it doesn't work at all. It's just that um, perhaps we, using these alternative chemicals is a little bit more complex than, than using uh, conventional products.